in this particular section we are going to discuss on a very common important at the same time easy topic that is on bronchial asthma first of all what do you mean by bronchial asthma even though the answer to this question i have given in a little bit of detail in copd section itself in the beginning of the video but let us again consider the fact and discuss what do you mean by bronchial asthma first of all it has to be clearly understood that bronchial asthma is a pft diagnosis you can't diagnose a bronchial asthma without a pft clear let us see how without a pft you can't diagnose a bronchial asthma because every textbook when you take they will give the pathophysiology of bronchial asthma then they will give some clinical features of bronchial asthma then they'll come to the investigations where you discuss about the pft but i always believe the fact that what is important remains important the diagnosis of the bronchial asthma remains the most important thing and the pft in bronchial asthma is going to be the most important that's why we discuss that first for a change and we'll move on to the pathophysiology of bronchial asthma so what is going to be the pft in bronchial asthma first of all do understand the patient may have an obstructive pft pft may show obstructive lung disease features or the pft may be completely normal why because bronchial asthma by definition is going to come in the form of attacks they don't present them I in they don't present like with clinical features all the time throughout the day and night which means they are going to come in the form of attacks only and that is also one reason why bronchial asthma is thought to be unpredictable which means you cannot tell when the attack will start and when the attack will end so the relief may be very spontaneous also so that's what my professor used to tell the only thing that that is predictable in a bronchial asthma is its unpredictability you can't really predict when the attacks will start and when the attacks will end so that is why i told you the pft can be obstructive features may be seen or a pft can be completely normal you may not see any features of bronchial asthma in the pft because the attack would have been over last night and the patient will come with a normal pft and please do not diagnose bronchial asthma based on the presence or absence of these clear so presence of these do not confirm bronchial asthma at the same time absence of these do not exclude a bronchial asthma in fact majority of the patients that you see in your clinic are not going to have these when you examine the next day after an attack clear which means they behave like you and me completely normal if they are going to have obstructive features the diagnosis is going to be extremely simple which means you have to just see one fact that your fe1 by fec ratio should be less than 0.7 this is the famous chiffenu pinelli index less than 0.7 means it's almost a definite obstructive feature so now how we are going to go about it so you have proved that this patient is having uh, fe1 by fec ratio of less than 0.7 but how will you diagnose bronchial asthma in this so in this particular patient i have to see lot of other different values like i have to prove the other nature of the bronchial asthma like i have to prove the hyper responsiveness of bronchial asthma which means this is one of the major problems in bronchial asthma that is bronchial hyper responsiveness that is also one reason that the term came reactive airway disease first of all you have to understand what is the basic thing about hyper responsiveness what do you mean by the fact hyper responsiveness then we'll go to the pft definition of hyper responsiveness the basic definition of hyper responsiveness is the fact that these patients respond to a relatively non specific stimuli which means this stimuli which is causing bronchoconstriction and reaction of the airways in a patient with a bronchial asthma is not going to cause any reaction or bronchoconstriction in a normal patient otherwise normal patient so this is what we refer to as bronchial hyper responsiveness for example in an instance it's a very simple thing the first way to prove this bronchial hyper responsiveness is by doing an exercise and do an exercise and do a pft so if you do exercise and if you do a pft if the fe1 fall is at least more than 15 percentage from the previous value this can tell you that the bronchus is hyperreactive clear 
So this is one way to prove that it's a bronchial asthma, point number one. At the same time, the second feature of bronchial asthma which you are trying to prove here is the variability. So what do you mean by this variability? Bronchial asthma is one disease which is going to show substantial variability in the pulmonary function test. For example, a patient who might have a different value of Fe1 and PFR in the morning may have a different value of Fe1 and the PFR in the evening. At the same time, a patient who had a different uh, pulmonary function test during an attack may have a different PFT the next time when they get another attack. So it can vary between attacks and it can vary between morning and evenings itself. So which means they are going to show a substantial diurnal variation and they are going to show substantial inter-attack variability also, which means again they are unpredictable. They show their face again. So how can you tell the variability in PFT terms? So we give the PFR peak flow meter to the patient and ask them to measure the PFR and write it down or we can do by ourselves as well. So if the PFR variability shows more than 20 percentage diurnal variation, more than 20 percent of diurnal variation in at least three days per week for at least three days per week. So the PFR variability has at least 20% diurnal variation between morning and night for at least three days per week is again is a feature of bronchial asthma and that is what we called as variability in airway responsiveness. Next comes the most important. So this is what we call it as something called reversibility, reversibility testing. So how can you tell that the patient is you know like uh, show, going to show reversibility. So the reversibility testing means I am going to use a bronchodilator or a steroid to assess the response. So if I am going to use, typically most commonly they use a bronchodilator and after that 15 to 20 minutes later they do another PFT after salbutamol embolization typically. So if the improvement in the FE1 and the pulmonary function test is going to reach a specific cutoff, we can call that is a reversibility. For example, if there is an increase in FE1 by at least 12 percentage in relative terms or at least 200 ml in absolute terms. So this is what we characteristically define as reversibility, clear? So this is what I wanted to tell. Bronchial asthma means it's a, I mean it's a syndrome or it's a complex consisting of hyper responsiveness of the airways, variability in responsiveness at the same time reversibility of the obstruction. So these are the three things that form the cornerstone for diagnosis of a bronchial asthma. But one problem in these patients who have an obstructive PFT and diagnosis of bronchial asthma is the fact that all these three features of hyperresponsiveness, reversibility and variability can be seen in certain patients with COPD also. That is why it becomes really, really difficult to make sure that the patient is whether is suffering from a bronchial asthma or a COPD. Especially what variant of COPD is likely to have overlap with these kind of bronchial asthma patients is the fact that the patients with chronic bronchitis are the ones that are going to show this overlap. But remember, if they have a persistently obstructed PFT like FE1 by FEC ratio of less than 0.7, it's very difficult to diagnose a bronchial asthma. But the most important thing that differentiates a bronchial asthma from a COPD is the fact that they may have a normalization of the PFT. If you prove this normalization of the PFT, it's absolute that the patient is having a bronchial asthma only, which means this normalization of the PFT can be spontaneous, which means even without any treatment, like I told you, the patient would have had an attack the previous day, the next day they come and they show a completely normal PFT. So this normal normalization of the PFT may be completely spontaneous or it can, after, it can happen after a treatment also. Typically, this is what we call it as after bronchodilator, post bronchodilator. 
which means it can be either spontaneous or it can be after treatment or post bronchitis. But if you prove the fact that the patient is having normalization of the PFT, then you are going to be absolutely sure that this patient is suffering from a bronchial asthma. Because by definition, COPD is a fixed airways disease and PFTs are never going to normalize in these patients. Clear? So, that is the fact I am telling here. The reversibility doesn't mean normalization of the PFT, which means improvement in FE1 by 12 percentage or increased by 200 ml doesn't mean the PFT has normalized. But if the PFTs are normalizing, it is equal to bronchial asthma. But if the PFTs are not going to normalize, you are stuck in a box. Clear? It's not so easy to differentiate a bronchial asthma from a COPD in that particular patient. Do you understand? Suppose that's what I told you. A lot of COPD patients, for example, some patients, not all the patients, some patients with chronic bronchitis may show reversibility by the criteria. But I till still told you that this reversibility does not mean normalization of the PFT, which means they may show by criteria wise, they may show this reversibility and they may show the bronchial hyperresponsiveness also, which means they are having certain features of bronchial asthma, but not all the features of bronchial asthma, which means their PFTs are fixed and they never normalize at any cost. At the same time, they show the reversibility and bronchial hyperresponsiveness also. Clear? So, this is what we define as something called an asthma COPD overlap. So, previously, what we are, I mean, trying to call these patients as an asthma COPD overlap syndrome, that's called ACOS. But now, it's really difficult. We tend to call these patients as COPD only. Unless and until the PFT is normalized, they are going to fix it. PFT and obstruction is not going to normalize. Means these patients will be under category of COPD only. But just these are COPD patients who are showing bronchial hyperresponsiveness. Which means this is the reason for the famous Dutch hypothesis also. What do you mean by Dutch hypothesis? The Dutch hypothesis told the fact that bronchial asthma and COPD, especially the chronic bronchitis part of COPD, are a group of single spectrum. Are a group of single spectrum, which means both are going to belong to the same disease. Let me put under a single, single box. Both are going to belong to a similar disease. So, both are not going to be different diseases. In the sense, both have some irritation to the airways, some evidence of irritation to the airways, either by environmental pollutants or it could be your smoking, doesn't matter. Both have some evidence of irritation to the airways. Number two, both bronchial asthma as well as COPD is going to show bronchial hyperresponsiveness. And both are going to show, in a way, airway remodeling airway remodeling. Clear? So, remember, if in early stages, the irritation and hyperresponsiveness will be the case and in late stages, they are going to go for airway remodeling and this airway remodeling is the one that is going to produce the sputum that is characteristic of chronic bronchitis. Clear? Which means what the Dutch hypothesis is telling is that this is a very, very you know, like uh, evidence-based hypothesis and this is a new hypothesis and this is really accepted by many uh, pulmonary medicine physicians also. Where initially you have asthma, maybe a subtle asthma, it doesn't matter, but where you don't manifest the symptoms classically, but slowly, slowly, slowly over the process, over, over a period of time, you are going to enter into a phase where the PFTs will no longer normalize and will become fixed and you enter the stage of chronic bronchitis and start producing sputum. Clear? Okay. Suppose, at the same time, there are a lot of bronchial asthma patients. I told you there are a lot of COPD patients who show features of bronchial asthma. That could be, you know, like an overlap syndrome. But similarly, a lot of bronchial asthma patients also show features of COPD, which means these people may have normalization of the PFT, which means it's a completely normal PFT. And second thing, these people may also show reversibility 
by FE1 criteria. These people may also show bronchial hyperresponsiveness. These people may also show variability, which means each and every single uh, fact which I told you about bronchial asthma is there in this patient, including the normalization of the PFT between the attacks. But they may also show additionally chronic sputum production chronic sputum production that might meet the definition of a chronic bronchitis which means according to chronic bronchitis definition you should have just three months of sputum for just two consecutive years so three months of sputum in a year for at least two consecutive years so that is what the definition of a chronic bronchitis so a patient with a bronchial asthma may show features of a chronic bronchitis and that is why this terminology came something called a chronic asthmatic bronchitis chronic asthmatic bronchitis clear so even though a lot of confusing terminologies are there i told you a lot of terminologies here asthma copd overlap your chronic asthmatic bronchitis bronchial asthma so you have a lot of confusing terminologies but in general it's a very simple fact that whenever you have an obstructive pft clear and whether normalization is possible or not that's what you have to see to avoid all the confusion now the things have become very simple whether normalization is there or not if normalization is there yes if normalization is not there no if there is a normalization of the pft yes means it is a bronchial asthma that's all no matter what whether it is showing bronchitis features or not doesn't matter. If there is a normalization, you are going to diagnose only a bronchial asthma. That's why I told you this normalization of PFT is going to be the gold standard. Suppose if you don't have this normalization of the PFT, then these patients will be coming under COPD only. These patients will be coming under COPD. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Clear? So now you are going to see whether the airways are reversible or irreversible. So, test the reversibility and probably plus or minus whether the airways are hyper responsive or not. So, typically, if yes, they will be again be called as COPD patients only, there is no doubt about that. But in general, they will have a overlap with bronchial asthma. That's what we call it as asthma COPD overlap syndrome. So, they will be put under something called ACOS. So, they will be still COPD only. There will be no doubt. If they are not reversible, definitely they are COPD only. Again, there is no doubt about that. In that, either they can be chronic bronchitis or they can be a emphysema phenotype. The only thing that can differentiate concretely between a chronic bronchitis and emphysema is a DLCO. Is a DLCO and a lot of other features also which I told you, where in the PFT I am telling you, this is the only thing that can differentiate in the PFT, where in emphysema DLCO will be low, whereas in chronic bronchitis DLCO must be normal by definition. So, this is the very easy thing, this is a very concept oriented thing, but remember this normalization of the PFT, then only you can concretely diagnose it is a bronchial asthma. But if there is no normalization of the PFT, still they may show that reversibility with your bronchodilators and to an extent they can show bronchial hyperresponsiveness also. These patients will come under still COPD only, but it is just like they will be overlapping with bronchial asthma. Maybe these patients are patients who had a chronic bronchial asthma, which means subtle bronchial asthma from childhood due to occupational exposure or due to allergen exposure. Continuously, they are coughing, wheezing, coughing, wheezing. And over time, the airways have irreversibly remodeled, resulting in development of fixed airway obstruction and leading to COPD, as per the Dutch hypothesis, which we have already discussed. Clear? So, despite all the confusions, if somebody asks you what are the myriad of PFT findings that will tell you that the patient is having bronchial asthma, it's hyperresponsiveness, variability, and reversibility. Clear? So, these are the classic features of bronchial asthma and airway hyperresponsiveness. Clear? Now, if the PFT normalizes, the PFT is normal. Now, the question comes to your mind, how then you can diagnose it's a bronchial asthma? Because my PFT is normal, but the patient will have history of symptoms of wheeze or something that is typical of a bronchial asthma. 
but you are not seeing any Vs. The clinical finding, because if the PFT is normal, means the clinical findings also may be completely normal. But even if there is a Vs, if the PFT is normal, I cannot diagnose a bronchiasma. How is it possible? These patients to pick up. That's why you have this reversibility criteria, which means even though if the PFT is normal in certain groups of bronchial asthma patients, especially if the bronchial asthma is in very early stage, the PFT may completely normalize immediately after the attack. So, which means it doesn't mean that these patients don't have bronchial asthma. They have this hyper responsiveness and they have this all the characteristics of bronchial asthma during the attack, but it has subsided now. That's all. But how we are going to pick up these patients? Just do a reversibility testing again. You might ask me, it doesn't make any sense to me how I can check the reversibility testing here because the PFT is normal. How you are going to check the reversibility? Yes, trust me, still you do a reversibility testing by doing a bronchodilator test. See the FE1 post bronchodilator. If the FE1 improves by at least 20, 12 percentage from the baseline in relative terms or if it increases by at least 200 ml in absolute terms, they are meeting the criteria for reversibility. At the same time, they are also having a normal PFT which is documented already which means it is a sure shot you can diagnose these patients as bronchial asthma which means the reversibility of the PFT and you are meeting the reversibility criteria means the moment you give bronchial test, the bronchus expands means itself it is hyper responsive which means by doing a bronchodilator test in a patient with a normal PFT, you are proving the patient to be having hyper responsive airways. At the same time, you are proving the reversibility to bronchodilators also, which clearly tells your patient is suffering from bronchial asthma. There is no doubt about that. But if they are not showing reversibility, which means the reversibility testing is negative. What I am trying to tell is, if reversibility is positive, if this testing is positive, definitely I am going to diagnose this patient as a bronchial asthma. There is no doubt about that. But if this testing is negative, what you are going to do? Which means every single PFT test is coming out to be negative. There is no reversibility, there is no variability. You know, like you cannot prove anything by routine PFT testing. But the patient is telling symptoms and signs that are very typical of a bronchial asthma. What you are going to do? You are going to prove the bronchial hyper responsiveness as the final resort and that is where you are going to go for this metacholine challenge. Metacholine challenge test. So, this is a very very important test in exam. If at all if somebody asks why you do a metacholine challenge, obviously it is to prove bronchial hyper responsiveness but where you do metacholine challenge is the fact that you have a high suspicion of bronchial asthma but in all your routine PFT testing are normal. If your entire PFT testing is normal, but the patient is telling typical signs and symptoms of bronchial asthma, the only way to prove is methacholine challenge. So, methacholine challenge means you have to give methacholine dose and serially you will give increasing dose of methacholine and see at what dose of methacholine the FE1 drop is reaching at least 20 percentage. Suppose if the FE1 decline is achieved at least to a range of 20 percentage from the baseline if you want decline because you are proving the hyper responsiveness here not the reversibility you are actually inducing the bronchoconstriction by giving methacholine if the FU1 declines by at least 20 percentage from the baseline with doses of methacholine of less than 16 to 25 microgram per ml so below this dose if you achieve this FE1 decline to at least 20 percentage, we call this as positive methacholine test and you can tell that this patient is having a likely bronchial asthma because they are having hyper responsive airways. But remember a lot of normal patients like me and you who may have hyper responsive airways but we are never going to develop bronchial asthma, clear? For example, to some patient, some things, I mean to not, to not tell patient, to some person something may not be going along, going well. Like for example, some people may not like the smoke, some people may be allergic to cigarette smoke. If they see the cigarette immediately, their bronchus go for bronchoconstriction and they start coughing. The moment the cigarette smoke goes in, even if the passive smoking is the case. So, but you do not develop bronchial asthma through your entire lifetime. So, which means your hyper-responsive airways 
doesn't tell you it's a bronchiasma. That's why I put the fact that it's a likely bronchiasma. But if you still have this test to be negative, which means there is no bronchial hyper responsiveness, there is you have you don't have the reversibility testing to prove also. At the same time, the PFT is normal also, which means this patient are unlikely to have bronchial asthma. That's why this test rules out bronchial asthma. First of all, you have to know the utility of this methacholine challenge test. Where it is most utilized is the fact that this will be used in patients who are having all routine normal PFTs despite all the efforts. But signs and symptoms are typical of bronchial asthma. Those patients only are going to uh, go for meta methacholine challenge. And most important fact is that methacholine challenge test may be useful to rule out a bronchial asthma rather than a confirming a bronchial asthma, which means if methacholine challenge test is negative, it typically rules out bronchial asthma for sure, without a doubt. Clear? So this is the entire spectrum and conundrum of how we make a real-time diagnosis of bronchial asthma and that is why this is something very, very important to understand. Clear? So how will you go about a patient who is having an obstructed PFT and how to diagnose a bronchial asthma from that? And how will you diagnose a patient with a normal PFT and how you are going to go about that? Clear? So both can be clear. And what do you mean by an asthma COPD overlap syndrome and how bronchial asthma has an overlap with chronic bronchitis and who's, which patients are called as chronic bron asthmatic bronchitis and which patients will be called as COPD with asthma overlap. That is asthma COPD overlap syndrome. All these things we have discussed in detail. But ultimately everything comes into the three definitions only. That is reversibility, variability and hyper responsiveness. That exercise induced hyper responsiveness definition and reversibility that FE1 based definitions and variability PFR based definitions. And finally, you have to also know the methacholine challenge based definitions of hyper responsiveness. These are the four things that are the most important for your exam. Gold standard. Even if you forget everything, no, no worries for exam. Just remember these four, you will still be a rock star. Clear. So, we have discussed in detail about all the diagnostic features of bronchial asthma. But next, what we are going to see are the types of bronchial asthma. So, let us see what you mean by the types, types of bronchial asthma. First of all, there are two types of bronchial asthma. One is called an extrinsic bronchial asthma. Second one is an intrinsic bronchial asthma. Extrinsic bronchial asthma is also referred to as an allergic bronchial asthma. Intrinsic is also referred to as a non-allergic bronchial asthma. Which means if it is allergic means they will have a strong history of atopy. At the same time they will have a strong family history because they have atopy. Atopy itself will have family history. And non-allergic you know very well they are non-atopic, they are not going to have any history of atopy. At the same time, they will not have any significant family history also since they are not having atopy history. Since they are allergic, you know very well, they are mediated by IgE, which is a classic type 1 hypersensitive reaction. Here, do remember, non-allergic, so non-IG mediated, so they are not mediated by type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. You are calling it allergic, so which means there should be some triggers. So, what are the triggers? The triggers could be anything and everything. Right from starting from your dust mite, inhaled allergens, dust mites, to cockroaches, to cats, antigens from cats, cat antigens, molds, certain fungus, pollens that are coming from certain trees and grasses. So, anything it could be. Pollens are very common in India. At the same time, these cockroaches are very common allergens in Indian setting. But on the other hand, if you ask about the triggers for an intrinsic asthma, most of the triggers will be non-specific irritants like viral infections, cold exposure. These are very, very non-specific triggers. So, these are the things that are going to be triggers for a case of intrinsic asthma. And extrinsic asthma typically starts in the childhood and relatively more, more, more common than intrinsic asthma. This intrinsic asthma typically starts in early adulthood and 
relatively less common compared to that of the extrinsic arsenic. And next, attacks are predictable here. Even though asthma itself is an unpredictable disease, but to an extent, these attacks and the disease course will be predictable. But intrinsic asthma patients do have a very, very unpredictable course in a general asthma that itself is unpredictable. So these patients tend to have an unpredictable course. These patients tend to have a predictable course. And these are the patients, I told you, these are having non-specific triggers, which means they are having non-specific allergens, which means it could be from occupation environment also. So that is also the reason why these patients have a high risk of developing chronic asthmatic bronchitis and the COPD overlap many times. They go for chronic airway remodeling and they enter the COPD stage also. Or they have high risk of developing nasal polyps as well. So these are the patients that are high risk of developing nasal polyps also. So these are things that you have to know about intrinsic as well as extrinsic asthma. At the same time, you have a lot of subtypes of intrinsic asthma, which means it is which is not Ig related or Ig mediated. The first one is what we called as exercise induced asthma. Exercise induced asthma. Remember, this sensitivity to exercise, that is exercise causing drop in Fe1 is seen in all the bronchial asthma patients. Understand the fact that exercise causing bronchospasm and decline Fe1 is seen in almost universally in almost every single extrinsic asthma patient. But exercise as a sole reason for bronchoconstriction is what we call as excess induced asthma. Again, I am repeating exercise induced hyperresponsiveness and bronchoconstriction and decline Fe1 is seen in almost every single case of extrinsic asthma. But Exercise as the only reason for bronchospasm without any other reason for bronchospasm is what we are going to call it as exercise induced asthma. It is completely different from your routine extrinsic bronchial asthma. So, when the excess induced bronchial asthma will start? I mean, if it is an excess induced asthma, when it will start? Typically, after 10 to 20 minutes of exhaustive exercise. 10 to 20 minutes of exercise, you are going to develop this exercise induced bronchial asthma. Number, number two, this might be due to exposure to the cool air also. These patients may also have sensitivity to the cold air or they might have sensitivity to hyperventilation that is happening during the exercise because during exercise you tend to hyperventilate. So that could also be the trigger. So these are the postulated triggers. But remember, excess induced asthma is not Ig mediated. I told you cool air causing asthma or causing bronchoconstriction is going to come under intrinsic type only it's a non-specific trigger clear so that's what happens here their hyperventilation and exposure to cold air may be the reason or rapid warming and drying that like during your exercise your air that is moving in will be having more warmth and will be more humid because of the uh, i mean metabolism that is happening in your body and the heat that is generated but the moment you stop the exercise you might uh, you know like result in cooling of the air and the warm wa i mean air might become less hum humid also so more drier so that also could precipitate the i mean these are all the things that are thought to induce the bronchial hyperresponsiveness here clear and how can you prevent or treat these patients because they have to i mean do something when they even if they walk and they get bronchospasm it's not good so how will you prevent this use a short acting bronchodilator like Saba short acting beta 2 agonist or a Montelukast before starting the exercise. Montelukast before starting the exercise. So that's what you are going to do. Number two, aspirin induced bronchial asthma or aspirin induced asthma. Now, rather than calling aspirin induced asthma, the new name came that is called aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. That is otherwise referred to as AERD. Aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. So, what is aspirin induced asthma? Please note the fact that aspirin sensitivity is not equivalent to aspirin induced asthma. Both are different entities. I told you aspirin sensitivity is different. Like only aspirin sensitivity may happen in extrinsic asthma patients also. Approximately 5% of extrinsic asthma patients show aspirin sensitivity. 
that doesn't mean it's aspirin induced asthma aspirin induced asthma means here aspirin is the sole reason for developing asthma here so that will come under intrinsic asthma only that will not be an extrinsic asthma because extrinsic asthma you have a lot of other features that will not come under this let us see this aspirin induced asthma will follow a typical triad called samtas triad so what is going to samtas triad these patients will have aspirin sensitivity all right but that's not the exclusive feature these patients also have asthma again there this is not an exclusive feature and they also have something called a nasal polyps again remember nasal polyps generation is a feature of intrinsic asthma which we have discussed already that's why aspirin induced asthma is a intrinsic asthma it's not an extrinsic asthma remember here aspirin is the sole reason for developing these symptoms if you stop aspirin all this will disappear clear so what is the reason for this aspirin induced asthma you know arachidonic acid has two pathways one is called the cox pathway another one is the lox pathway cox pathway generates prostaglandins lox pathway is going to generate leukotrienes and these leukotrienes are very powerful bronchoconstrictors we know that fact very very well so aspirin is going to block the cox pathway which means they might increase the lox pathway production and produce excessive leukotrienes and they can produce excessive bronchoconstriction so which means you can again see in aspirin induced asthma or in samtas triad there is no ig involved at all which means it's a type of intrinsic asthma again hence proved the treatment of aspirin induced asthma is giving a montelukast which means you are blocking the leukotrienes from acting leukotriene receptor antagonists like montelukast or zafirlukast so montelukast is a typically used to drug commonly but i believe that best thing is to stop the aspirin am i right or wrong you have to stop the aspirin that's all that's the best thing but even though in some cardiac patients like especially you have received a stent in those patients dapt dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel or any other p2y2 inhibitors is mandatory you cannot stop at least for some period of time so in those patients you can use this montelukast as a treatment otherwise in cases where you can stop aspirin stop aspirin that's the easiest way to treat this disorder and remember aspirin may not induce only induce a new asthma aspirin can worsen the asthma in extrinsic asthma patients also or aspirin can worsen any respiratory disease including COPD and other bronchiectasis and all so that's why this aspirin related spectrum is typically called as aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease and one of the forms of aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease is sampus triad and aspirin induced asthma that's all so i think you can get it the bigger spectrum now so how we are going towards and number 4 you have cough variant of asthma cough variant of asthma this is another type of intrinsic asthma only where the patient will have only cough without wheeze without wheeze and these patients also typically behave like asthma only they have bronchial hyper responsiveness they have reversibility all the features will be there but they will come only with cough and that too in the nocturnal time only remember it still responds to all the treatment that you give for bronchial asthma because this again i told you this patients will show airway hyper responsiveness reversibility and all so they are definitely going to respond to your routine bronchial asthma treatment and again this is a bronchial asthma only but intrinsic type of asthma not extrinsic remember top most three cause of cough chronic cough one is your grd second is post nasal drip due to sinusitis and third one is cough variant of bronchial asthma bronchial asthma could be a reason for chronic cough very common in fact so dd for chronic cough very common dd is in your opd number 5 occupational asthma this again an intrinsic asthma because it is non ig mediated that's why it's an intrinsic asthma and again it develops later in life because it's not atopy related and it develops only if the patient goes to some occupation which means it's not unpredictable it is predict i mean to an extent it's predictable only the patient the moment they go to the i mean work they develop this occupational asthma clear which means there is typical history that the patient will have problems only during the morning clear typically the patients will have problems only during the morning when they go to the office at the same time typically they show more symptoms during the mondays again that time they go to the office or any work office means and not meaning a corporate work or any work including a labor work which means the typical 
source of bronchoconstriction is present in the workplace only. So, this is the two histories morning more symptoms compared to the evening and Monday more symptoms compared to the other days. I mean in the sense weekends that is what we compare when they are in home. So, this will confirm it is a occupational asthma. And remember this is a very serious thing because if you do not treat this occupational asthma they can go for chronic bronchitis which means they can enter the COPD zone. That is why I told you intrinsic asthma patients may go for COPD chronic bronchitis phase. So, I mean they will go for irreversible airway modeling and that is what we call as COPD that hypothesis will be fulfilled here. So, be careful occupational asthma is something you should not uh, take it very lightly. The common sources for this occupation related bronchospasm and bronchoconstriction may be due to pigeons, chickens, certain resins like epoxy resins even for who is working in laboratory they can be having source from laboratory animals working in factories where metals like nickel and chromium may be the source certain plastics, rubber lot of things may act as a source for this occupational asthma. Clear? I have seen lot of I mean one uh, recent you know like a PhD fellow who had this lab animal related you know like allergen exposure because of that he started developing that uh, asthma and severe asthma in fact and uh, it was really really difficult for us to treat because the best treatment for this is to as much as possible avoid the work and if still it is not possible we have to give your routine uh, bronchodilators and you might be need to wear the protective masks and all where the patient may not be complained also please be you have to tell the patient very clearly if you do not consider this as a serious one you are going to enter into the irreversible COPD zone over a period of time ok. So, these are the different types of intrinsic asthma which I want to tell these are non IG mediated and still will be categorized under bronchial asthma because these also have typically showing going to show your hyper responsiveness variability all these things will be there in these patients also. So, and again they show normalization of the PFT because in occupational asthma if they do not go to the work they may have a normal PFT at least in the early stages later on they may go for reversible abnormal PFT but in early stages only when they go to the work they have abnormal PFT when they come back to home they may have a normal PFT. So, they are asthmatics only without a doubt, but it is a different type of asthma called intrinsic asthma. Again at the same time there is another entity called a seasonal allergic asthma. There are two things which are not discussed in routine textbooks that is called a seasonal allergic asthma. So, this seasonal allergic asthma one important problem is you do not know whether it is an extrinsic or intrinsic it could be extrinsic as well as it could be intrinsic that is why it is an overlap you really do not know. And second one you have another type called a brittle asthma and again this can happen in a type I mean intrinsic asthma as well as an extrinsic asthma. So, both can be brittle, but what are the seasonal allergic asthma which means they will get bronchoconstriction only during specific seasons only during a particular season some people I mean very commonly during the winter in our uh, Indian scenario they will get mostly during the December times and the November times during the winter times is what many times they will get this exacerbation probably as a result of cold exposure and that is the reason why it is an intrinsic type of asthma and some people you know like may have elevated Ig also that is why it is very difficult to predict. So, this is what we refer to as a seasonal allergic asthma and treatment you are only going to use a inhaled corticosteroids at a very low dose low dose inhaled corticosteroids throughout that particular season plus 4 weeks post exposure post season after 4 weeks I mean till you have to continue 4 weeks post exposure and you have to give throughout the season. So, this is the treatment for seasonal allergic asthma which means it is going to present only during particular season. Similarly, brittle asthma brittle asthma means uh, you know like the asthma is very brittle either it will be on one extreme it will not show uh, the in, I mean in between feature either they will be too bad or too good that is what we call a brittle asthma. So, let us see how it works. So, you have two types of brittle asthma one is called a type 1 brittle asthma second one is called a type 2 brittle asthma. In type 1 brittle asthma there will be a continuous PFR variability. What do you mean by a continuous PFR variability? 
that means throughout the day the PFR will keep on fluctuating that means at least more than 40 percent variability 40 percent variability for at least more than 50 percent of the days. The PFR variability in a standard asthma is at least 20 percent variability for at least three days per week. Here it is extremely variable, it is an extreme spectrum that is all of asthma only but it is an extreme spectrum where there will be more than 40 percent variability for at least more than 50 percent of the days. So, this is what we called as type 1 brittle asthma and type 2 brittle asthma will have no PFR variability or which means they do not show that much of PFR variability. I can tell it is a normal background PFT. But suddenly they will develop a severe attack. So, they will develop a severe acute and life threatening attack and that too within a short duration within 3 hours. Within a span of 3 hours just within 3 hours the bronchus will completely constrict and will go for life threatening attack. So, a normal baseline sudden attack which is life threatening or a continuous variability of PFR which is almost extreme stages compared to that of the standard bronchial asthma. So, these are what we refer to as a uh, brittle asthma. It has two types one is called type 1 and type 2 I told you the definitions already. Type 1 brittle asthma definitely they will ask you how to treat because you know these patients are having continuous PFR variability which means they will be extremely symptomatic throughout the day and night. So, these patients have to be treated best with subcutaneous terbutaline infusions. Subcutaneous terbutaline infusions. Clear? So, that is what you are going to do. These patients are we are going to do. There is no point in giving terbutaline continuously infusions and all. So, they will have a normal background PFT which means during the attack only it is a problem. So, you have to give them EpiPens. EpiPens. What do you mean by EpiPen? These are subcutaneous epinephrine auto injectors. So, they have to be supplied with EpiPens. The moment they know they are getting an attack, they are getting severe attack means immediately they will inject with epinephrine and they come to the hospital for safety. So, epipens are the best treatment, subcutaneous epinephrine auto injector. So, these are the two types of brittle asthma that you have to know. And finally, last but not the least, there are certain entities that can present like bronchial asthma. For example, a vocal cord dysfunction, a vocal cord dysfunction may present like a bronchial asthma. Clear? So, typically why I am telling you this will present like a bronchial asthma because you will have an obstructive PFT. You will have a obstructive PFT that is Fe1 by FEC ratio less than 0.7. Clear? But remember they will have no response to steroids and there will be no response to bronchodilators and there will be no hyperinflation on chest x-ray which means even the chest x-ray will be normal. Remember the only way to diagnose this vocal cord dysfunction that is presenting like asthma is seeing the flow volume loop shape. Flow volume loop shape you have to see that is what is going to clinch the diagnosis because I told you vocal cord dysfunction is a extra thoracic upper airway disease. So, I told you in extra thoracic upper airway disease, large airways disease, upper large airways disease. So, this is expiration, this is inspiration. Your primary problem will be during inspiration, which means you will have a normal expiratory curve and there will be inspiratory flattening. So, normally it should be like this, isn't it? So, but there will be typical inspiratory flattening will be there. So, this will suggest there is some variable extra thoracic large airways disease and in this case it will be vocal cord dysfunction. So, be very careful that is why the shape of the flow volume loops are sometimes very important. I have discussed this in detail in the PFT section itself. Let us see some images that is relevant to exams. You can see this is a typical image that you will see in atopy which means what you are seeing is you are seeing allergy and erythema to lot of common substances like grass, house dust, dust mite, cat, dog lot of allergens are reacting in this patient. And you can see this pattern how your excess induced asthma will behave where initially at 20 to 10 to 20 minutes after exercise there is going to be a sudden and sharp drop in FE1 but the recovery is not very sharp as it drops it is going to be gradual. So, this is a typical graph of FE1 drop and FE1 recovery in a 
excess induced asthma. So with this we are finishing the basic thing and we enter the pathophysiology of bronchial asthma. Pathophysiology of bronchial asthma is supposed to be very interesting but it is given in a very vague manner in many textbooks. But let us see how interesting it is. Let us put a graph because this graph is going to show the two characteristic phases. Let me put something like this. Okay, because I am going to discuss in two phases. So, this is the Fe1 and this is the time. So, where the reaction will start and how it will progress. So, pathophysiology wise you have two phases. The first phase is the sensitization phase and the second phase is the recurrent exposure phase. Recurrent exposure phase. So, what will happen during recurrent exposure of the same allergen? First thing in asthma is an exposure of an allergen. We are talking about extrinsic asthma. Remember, we are talking about a classic type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. That is the basis of asthma. It is a common type of asthma, extrinsic asthma only. Intrinsic asthma will have different, different pathophysiologies. We are not going to talk about that right now. So, this allergen will be recognized as an allergen by antigen presenting cell. I mean, they are going to be taken up and they will be presented via MNC class 2 to the T cell that is a naive T cell which we have discussed already in detail in the T cell chapter. And remember why this particular antigen only should be recognized by this antigen presenting cell as an antigen and allergen. For example, this could be a pollen. Let us assume for example, this is a pollen and why pollen has to be recognized as an allergen in the bronchial asthma patient, but not in me. I am not allergic to pollen. I am not having bronchial asthma, which means I do not have this susceptibility. Why? It is all depending on the genetics. Remember this recognition as an allergen has genetic susceptibility, which means only in few patients that will be recognized as an allergen and antigen. That is what we call genetic susceptibility and this susceptibility is based on a very important chromosome called chromosome 5q and this is where your susceptibility locus is there and this is a very important question in exam that is the one that confers the susceptibility to a particular allergen and that is the reason why apc recognized that as an allergen in the first place otherwise you won't have that and one important gene that is present that is having polymorphism in this chromosome number 5q that is increase the susceptibility is interleukin 13 polymorphism very important question again at the same time another important agent another important gene that can increase the susceptibility is it is a different gene that is called ADAM 33 gene polymorphisms. These are the two things that is going to cause the susceptibility to a particular allergen and it is going to recognize as an antigen. So now since the AP is recognizing that as an allergen it is going to sensitize this T, this T cells through interleukin 4 and they are going to get activated as a T helper 2 cell. The moment they are activated as T helper 2 cell, they are going to produce their signature cytokines after activation which all this we have discussed is interleukin 4, interleukin 5 and interleukin 13. This interleukin 4 is going to activate the plasma cells to produce the Ig secretion by class switching. And this interleukin 5 is going to activate the eosinophils and this interleukin 13 is going to activate the mucus producing glands. But all are just activated and they are waiting for the next exposure. So, this Ig typically is going to be captured by the mast cells. So, Ig once it is produced by plasma cells, all this will be captured by the mast cell and will be waiting on the surface for the next attack to happen. Which means if you see the Fe1, if this is the normal Fe1, baseline Fe1, so during sensitization phase, Fe1 is going to be the same throughout the sensitization phase, which means there is no bronchoconstriction yet. Sensitization. So there is no bronchoconstriction or drop in the Fe1 yet. Then comes the recurrent exposure phase. During the recurrent exposure phase, the same allergen comes into the system once again. 
same allergen comes into the system once again. The same allergen comes into the system once again. There are two people who are waiting for this. One is your mast cells with your immunoglobulin E on the surface. Clear? Once the allergen binds with this, the mast cells will be activated and they are going to cause degranulation. This mast cell degranulation is going to release a variety of substances, but the two most important according to me is histamine and leukotrienes. Leukotrienes are many types B4, D4, E4, but B4 is the most, I mean D4 is the most important according to me. So these are the two most important. Apart from that, they also release the platelet activating factor. They also release heparin, so many other substances they will release. But I feel histamine and leukotrienes are the most important. In that leukotrien D4 is only the most important. So this mast cell degranulation is going to cause a sharp decline in FE1. Clear? A sharp decline in FE1 followed by a recovery. Once the half-life of these compounds go off, they cause a recovery. So this is what is supposed to call as a early phase bronchoconstriction. Early phase bronchoconstriction which is typically mast cell mediated. Clear? This is typically mast cell mediated. But remember this allergen does not only act your mass, I mean activate your mast cells, this allergen is also going to activate your T helper cells. Remember these are T helper 2 cells which are actually memory cells now. From the previous exposure the, some cells have formed the memory cells. And the moment this allergen activates the this memory T helper cells and the memory B cells this becomes a secondary response and it will result in amplification of the response. You know this is the basic mechanism of booster. You know that very well. Initial response is less. Subsequent response are going to produce more and more immunogenic responses. Clear? So that's what we call the secondary immune response and it's the amplification response and it will be more faster and more efficient and more powerful also. So you are going to get amplification of the entire response which means this T helper 2 cells are going to produce more and more Ig, more and more eosinophilic activation and more and more mucus production. So they are going to produce severe eosinophilic activation and this activated eosinophils are going to release major basic protein that is MBP and they are also going to produce your favorite eosinophilic cationic protein ECP. So these are the two proteins that are going to produce severe damage to the airways because these are toxic proteins. They are going to produce severe damage to your airways and that is in long term they will also lead to airway remodeling. At the same time your T helper cells will also produce your IL-13. You also start producing this interleukin-13 that is further going to activate the mucus producing cells to produce more and more mucus. Clear? And all the air, I mean remodeling in the airways is due to the T helper 2 response only. And this eosinophilic secondary eosinophilic response is going to create a secondary drop in the FE1 and this is what we refer to as a late phase response. So this late phase response is typically due to the T cell mediated eosinophil activation. Clear? So this is what we refer to as late phase response. Late phase response typically due to eosinophils that is secondary to the T cell activation. Clear? After this, this kind of attacks will continue like this forever. The moment whenever the allergen comes, it will happen. Suppose repeated damage to the airways, suppose if it is not treated and if it is not avoided, repeated damage to the airways will result in permanent remodeling, may result in permanent remodeling and this is going to be the birth of asthma COPD, overlap syndrome and chronic asthmatic bronchitis. If you don't treat that at all, this is going to be the result finally. Clear? So, this is what is going to happen. Do you understand? So, this is the basic pathophysiology of bronchial asthma. So, that is the reason initially, even though we give bronchial letters, majority of the severe asthmatic attacks, especially this acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma, we treat with steroids. The idea of giving steroids during the initial attack phase itself is to downregulate the T helper to response and the eosinophilic response. That is again very important to understand. Clear the steroids also play a vital role here. So, this is the entire pathophysiology of bronchial asthma that you will be need to, needing to know. I think you got the entire pathophysiology in a very good way, in a very good nutshell. 
So this, because this many areas is based on the treatment also because we are going to target this interleukin 4, interleukin 5, interleukin 13, all these things will be targeted for treatment which we will be discussing in the next section again. At the same time, let us see some more images. So these are diagnostic images that is only for the sake of exams but otherwise these images are not that important. The first image that you need to know is what are these? These are nothing but Kirschman spirals. Kirschman spirals because this can be seen in the sputum samples or bile samples of an asthmatic patient during an acute attack. So what are these spirals? These are world appearances of mucus. These are nothing but mucus that have world or twisted appearance. Twisted appearances. These are nothing but mucus flux. These are what we refer to as Kirschman spirals. And what are these? These are supposed to be your charcot laden crystals. Charcot laden crystals, you can see a crystal here, one crystal here. So, this is a charcot laden crystal. So, what are these charcot laden crystals? This will be made of eosinophilic proteins. Eosinophilic proteins. Clear? So, what are the eosinophilic proteins? Typically, galactin 10 and lysophospholipase. These are the contents of this charcot laden crystals. You can see another one image. This image consisting of the airway epithelial cells in clusters. These are shed airway epithelial cells and this is due to toxic effect of major ba basic protein and eosinophilic cationic protein. These are shed surface epithelial cells from the bronchus that is coming out in the sputum and uh, this is what we called as Criola bodies. Criola bodies. And this image shows the uh, chronic remodeling. They will go for bronchospasm, mucus, redeem and hypersecretion. Initial phases all these things are reversible and uh, but in the later stages they might become progressively irreversible and all these changes may become permanent and that is the birth of chronic bronchitis. And uh, with this we can, I mean, wind up with this chapter and in the next section we will be discussing on the treatment of the bronchial asthma.